Sometimes I think What will people say of me When I'm only just a memory When I'm home where my soul belongs Was I loved But no one else would show up Was I Jesus to the least of us was my worship more than just a song? Technical difficulties. Of course. Ah. Whew. Okay. <laughs> open the dark, open wide, from the depths, from the height, I will bring a sacrifice. These hands lifted high Hear my zone, hear my cry I will bring a sacrifice I will bring a sacrifice Now lay me down, I'm not my own Lay me down, 
living up on my life. Take this time and let it shine, shine, shine. Take this time. Season 1, Episode 2 of Virtual Riverside Church in Quarantine uh, with the same uh, errors and issues that we have in your last episode. So, a um, couple things to mention. One, uh, we are still considered essential services and as long as we're six feet apart, we will continue to be uh, broadcasting Virtual Riverside to you. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, we hope all of you are doing well. We love and we miss you all very much. And uh, unless I'm missing anything, we're just going to keep going. Everlasting God, 
angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name. something. And uh, one of the things that I find interesting is that the, the name for blue didn't actually enter the language, any language, until about um, the 6th century BC. Now, it doesn't mean blue didn't exist. We just didn't realize it was there. Either humans couldn't see blue, their eyes just weren't able to detect it, or there just was no name for blue yet. Uh, if you read Homer's Odyssey, he actually describes the, uh, the ocean as being the color of wine. So I don't know about you, but the wines that I've seen are not blue, right? <laughs> That'd be kind of weird. Um, doesn't mean that blue wasn't there. There was just no name for it. It's always been there. Our eyes were surrounded by blue. They just couldn't detect it. They couldn't see it. So here's the thing. Naming God is a little bit more complicated than naming a color. Um, even for somebody like me, like I've got like five colors in my crayon box. Um, God's a lot more complicated than that. We give him names like comforter, waymaker, peacemaker. He is there, even if we can't see him. There's an interesting statistic out there right now that says that the, the suicide um, call line, those numbers are up by about 20% right now because people are so afraid. They're so um, challenged by uh, the disease, the changes that are coming with it. There's huge changes to our schedules, to our finances, to our day-to-day -day lives, and people are scared, and they're reaching out. Jesus came to this earth. He died for us. He made a way for us to have a personal connection with him. And all we have to do is call on his name, whether it be Jesus, Spirit, Father, Yahweh. It doesn't matter what name you use for him. He is there and he's listening. He's listening for our humblest to get on our knees and pray to his name. And he will give you peace and comfort and joy no matter what is going on outside your door. He is there for you if you listen and call on his name.
Hey kiddos, kids class today is being brought to you very remotely. Um, I decided to stay home, I had a little cough and I didn't want to risk anybody on the worship team or Pastor Ed, so decided to, um, to read my story from home. So we are going to be doing the Jesus Storybook Bible again, and this time we are going to be on page 244. This story comes out of the New Testament. New Testament is the stories um, that are all about Jesus and his life here and what happened um, after he went up to heaven. So we're gonna be reading a story called Filled Full, also known as the Feeding of the 5,000. You can find this in the New Testament in Matthew 14, Mark chapter six, and Luke chapter nine. There once were 5,000 tired and hungry and probably pretty grumpy people sitting on a hillside wanting their dinner. They come to hear Jesus that day. They came before breakfast, stayed all morning, all afternoon, and way past dinner. No one had meant to be out there that long, but that's how it was when you were listening to Jesus, as if time didn't exist. People could listen to Jesus for hours, and on this particular day, that's just what they did. But they hadn't brought enough food, and they couldn't just go and buy themselves a burger and fries to go because, of course, they were in the middle of nowhere with no shops or restaurants, and besides, that kind of food hadn't even been invented yet. So what would they do? Well, Jesus' friends had an idea. Let's send everyone home for dinner. They don't need to go, Jesus said. You can give them something to eat. Did Jesus want them to travel all the way to town and buy food for everyone? Whew, Jesus' friends panicked. But we don't have enough money. What food do you have? Jesus asked. Go and see. Now, there was a little boy in the crowd and he had brought a lunch that his mother had made for him that morning. And he looked at his five loaves and two fish. It wasn't much, not nearly enough for 5,000, but it was all he had. I have some, he said. Jesus' friends laughed when they saw his little lunch. That's not nearly enough, they said, but they were wrong. Jesus knew it didn't matter how much the little boy had. God would make it enough, more than enough. Jesus said, bring me what you have. And so the little boy gave Jesus his lunch. Jesus winked at the little boy and whispered in his ear, how in the world will Jesus feed everyone with just that, Jesus' friends said, because they thought it was impossible. But Jesus knew the one who made all the fish in the oceans, and Jesus knew the one who in the very beginning had made everything out of nothing at all. How hard would something like this be for someone like that? Jesus took the little boy's lunch, looked up to heaven, and thanked his father. Then Jesus gave the little lunch back to his friends. As Jesus' friends started to hand out the food, do you know what? It was the strangest thing. No matter how much they broke off, 
there was always more and more and more, enough for 5,000. Everyone ate as much as they wanted, second helpings, third helpings, even fourths, until they were full. And still, there were leftovers. Well, Jesus did many miracles like this, things people thought couldn't happen that weren't natural, but it was the most natural thing in all the world. It's what God had been doing from the beginning, of course, taking the nothing and making it into everything, taking the emptiness and filling it up, and taking the darkness and making it light. Welcome to our second attempt of doing church alone together. Uh, and uh, Aniela, like you saw, isn't with us. Uh, she had a little bit of a scratchy cough, which I have a feeling as allergy season approaches, an awful lot of us are going to be experiencing that and being like, oh, wait, wait, wait. And uh, so she just didn't want to take the chance that this was, uh, you know, something that she could pass on to everybody else. So she stayed home. Uh, the rest of us, there's eight of us here today, uh, and we are social distanced out, let me just tell you. And so it's like everybody is six feet apart, and uh, we are making sure to be very, very careful. But shock of all shocks, the state of Alaska considers us to be essential. And uh, that made us feel really, really good, actually. It took us a long time to track down whether that was true or not, but we heard from the governor's office and from the 211 uh, information line that Yes, we are essential, and so thank God for that, and uh, thank God for all of you joining us uh, today uh, online. Uh, we're going to be, uh, well, a couple of quick announcements. Text the word LOOP to that phone number there if you would like to stay kind of in the loop when there are big uh, announcements that we want to kind of blast out to everybody at once. Uh, Aniela is doing a thing with Thrive that's called Marco Polo. It's some app for their phones, and so uh, if you're part of Thrive, then... Uh, then check in and see what's going on. Men's group is doing Zoom meetings, and so if that's something that you're interested in, message me. I will send uh, your messages on to Hank, and he will get in touch with you. They're doing Monday nights and Saturday mornings. Uh, Facebook, best place for up-to-date information. Uh, we also release the uh, devotional, the reflections there, and then uh, the riversidecommunity.net. You can find all kinds of information there as well. Uh, but today, we are continuing with this year of cultivating, and today we are going to talk about how to cultivate peace in a time of turmoil. Now, I gave almost this exact same lesson, different video clips, uh, different uh, stories, a couple of different scriptures, because we're in kind of a different time. But I gave almost this exact same message about four months ago, right around Thanksgiving. And really, over the last 20 years that I've been the pastor here at Riverside, I've given almost this exact same lesson at least once a year, most of the time twice a year, and every once in a while, uh, three times in a year. And the reason is, because eventually every single one of us is going to find ourselves in a world filled with turmoil. Now, this is unprecedented because all of us are experiencing it together, not just in our little community here at Riverside and not just in the city of Eagle River or Anchorage or the state of Alaska or even the country, the entire world experiencing this at the same time. But over the last 20 years, I have continued to give these lessons because all of us at one point or another personally will have turmoil that it has earth-shaking consequences for us. And so this, I thought, over the last 20 years was one of the most important lessons that we as followers of Jesus could learn in order to deal with turmoil and anxiety and worry and stress and fear when it pops up. And so when I preached it back in November of 2019, I said, now this, we should start working these steps so that when we need them, we'll have them ready. Um, and when I say steps, I'm referring to something that uh, the Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verses 78 and 79. It says, God's sunrise will break in upon us, shining on those in the darkness, those sitting in the shadow of death, then showing us 
the way, one foot at a time, down the path of peace. Peace, as it turns out, is not really so much a destination. It's not a feeling, right? It is a path that we choose to walk. And that over time, if we work these steps that Paul is going to give us in Philippians chapter 4, peace can overwhelm the worry, the stress, the turmoil in our lives. But it's not something that's just going to go away forever. But I, I, I've, I was giving this lesson back in November. I'm giving it again tonight because I have a feeling that if you're anything like me, you may have listened in November, even if you were here and thought, you know, that's really good advice. If I ever need that advice, I will, I will put those steps into practice. But my life's pretty good right now. Why do I need to bother practicing with that right now? I do that a lot. Um, and so I'm doing it again because I have a feeling you're probably thinking, are we going to go over those instructions again? Which reminded me, I'm sure you're all shocked, of a Seinfeld clip. Let's watch this. Excuse, Excuse me, can I get something to drink? Uh, I'm afraid not. <laughs> well, what's, what's with this airline? What are you, cutting out the drinks now? No, sir, we're flying into a blizzard. Please fasten your seatbelt. We're making an emergency landing. Are they going to go over the instructions again? <laughs> My name is Bill. I might be the last person you ever see. And so we're, we're doing it again, just in case you were like thinking, uh, are we going to go over the instructions again? Yes, we are. Uh, the, this is Paul's and God's recipe for, for overwhelming stress and fear and turmoil in our lives. And it's all found in Philippians chapter 4. So the first step or the first ingredient in this recipe of overwhelming stress is to always choose joy. Always choose joy. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one because two weeks ago we spent a lot of time on it. Last week even we spent some time on it. Joy is one of the most important things that we as followers of Jesus can choose. It's, it's, it's very much related to peace in that it's not really an emotion the way that the Bible defines it. It's a choice. It's a way of looking at life, which is why Paul could say in Philippians 4 verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, if joy is an emotion, it's impossible to follow that advice. But if joy, as the Bible says, is a way of looking at life and a way that we choose to approach life, then this is something that we, that we can do and that we need to do because joy also brings strength to us. We can be joyful in the midst of our greatest happiness, but we can also choose joy in the midst of our deepest sorrow and our greatest grief. And I have done funerals here at this church where I have watched as people cho chose joy in the midst of, of their deepest grief and seen as the strength, the joy of the Lord that brings us strength is, was released in their lives. And that's why joy is something that Paul could say, do it, rather than so often what people say to us is, you need to stop doing the negative stuff, right? Stop focusing. You know, just, well, I don't know if you've ever seen this video clip before from Mad TV. It's one of my absolute favorites. Uh, it'll make sense, I think, as we watch it. Let's watch. Uh, Dr. Switzer? Uh, yes, C come in. I'm just, just washing my hands. Uh, I'm Catherine Bigman. Janet Carlisle referred me. Oh, yes. Uh, still being uh, buried alive in a box. Yes. Yes, that's me. <laughs> and let, let me uh, tell you a, a bit about our, our billing. I, um, I charge $5 for the, for the first five minutes. And, and then absolutely nothing after that. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I can, I can almost guarantee you that, that our session won't last the full, uh, the full five minutes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and go. <laughs> go. Well, tell what? me, tell me about the problem uh, that you wish to address. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I have this fear of being buried alive in a box. 
I just, I start thinking about being buried alive and I begin to panic. Has anyone ever, ever tried to, to bury you alive in a box? No, no, but truly thinking about it does make my life horrible. I mean, I can't go through tunnels or be in an elevator or in a house, anything boxy. So what, what you're saying is you're, uh, you're claustrophobic. Uh, yes. Yes, that's it. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let's go, Catherine. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, say two words to you right now. I, I want you to listen to them very, very carefully. Then I want you to take them out of the office with you and incorporate them in, into your life. Well, shall I uh, write them down? Well, it, if it makes you comfortable, it's just two words. Most, we find most people can, uh, can remember them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You ready? Yes. Okay, here, here they are. Stop it! <laughs> I'm sorry? Stop it! Stop it? Yes, S-T-O-P, new word, I-T. So, what are you saying? <laughs> you, you know, it's funny. I, I, I say two simple words, and I cannot tell you the amount of people who say exactly the same thing you're saying. I mean, this, you know, this is not Yiddish, Catherine. This is English. Stop it. So, I should just stop it. There you go. I mean, you, you, you don't want to go through life being scared of being buried alive in a box, do you? I mean, that sounds, sounds frightening. <laughs> it is. Then stop it. I can't. I mean, it's been with me no, since no, no, childhood. No, no, no. No, we, 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 we don't go there. Just, just stop. So I should just stop being afraid of being buried alive in a box. You got it. Good go. Well, it's only been, it's only been three minutes, so that will be um, uh, three dollars. We'll come back to the rest of that session here in just a minute, but that's what I love about. Jesus. That's what I love about Paul. That's what I love about the Bible. He never just says, do something or don't do something without telling us how to go about it. And so, you know, he's going to keep going. This, this isn't the end of the, of, of the advice. He doesn't just say, okay, you want to overwhelm worry and turmoil in your life? Just rejoice in the Lord always, okay? Just do it, you know? Or stop being filled with turmoil. He just, he doesn't do it. He goes on from there, okay? So, that's the first step. Second step, don't worry about anything. Now, I don't know about you, but I look at that and I'm like, is that even possible? Well, yes, it is. And we'll get to how he tells us to go about not worrying when we get to point number three. But for now, well, let's look at what he says. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 5. We already read, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he goes on, and don't worry about anything. But we're humans, and we can't help but worry. We talked last week about the different uh, components of anxiety and worry and how physiology was a part of it, that some of us are just wired to worry about things and others just aren't. And then you add to that our psychology, the things that have happened to us in the past, the things that are going on right now. It's like just saying don't worry is is almost cruel if you don't tell people then, okay, number one, if you do worry, join the club, right? It is a very human thing to do. It is a very natural thing to do. All of us, to one degree or another, do it. It might be for different reasons in different situations and with different circumstances, but all of us do it. It's very natural. It's very human. But if we cultivate worry in our lives, we will create an incredibly dark and toxic way of looking at life and way of going through life. This whole lesson series has been based on cultivating the things that we want and not cultivating the things that we don't want. And so you can't just stop worrying, right? I can't just look at you and you say, I, but I am worrying. Well, stop it, right? It, that doesn't work. It doesn't work for anybody. And so what Paul's going to do is he's going to tell us what to do instead. But before we get there in point number three, let me just say, 
it's going to all kind of come down to the concept of trust. In John 13, verse 7, Jesus says to his disciples, this is the night before he's going to die, okay? Uh, and he says to them, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. Now, that's like the understatement of the century, right? They don't understand what he's doing there at the moment, washing their feet, doesn't make any sense. They don't understand the things that he's been telling them, that he has to go away, that they can't come with them, that they're going to kill him, that he's going to come back. None of it makes any sense. But one day they, well, three days later, actually, they looked back and they said, oh, that's what he meant. And Suddenly, they were filled with this trust for this guy that what he said, they could actually take to the bank. Back in November, when I was getting ready for this lesson, I saw this uh, on, on Facebook. It says, uh, this is why I try not to worry. And it has that John chapter 13, verse 7 underlined. You don't know what, what, now what I'm doing, but later you will. It's all going to come down to trust. And that's what's important, that we... The, let me say this, to the extent that you and I could learn to trust Jesus perfectly, we would never struggle with worry again. Now, you and I are probably never going to get there, right? I would almost say assuredly we will never get there, but we can work on trusting Jesus more and more in our lives, working these steps, which will bring more joy and more peace and more trust, which over time then will overwhelm the turmoil that we do have in our lives. Point three, pray about everything. This is the third ingredient in this recipe of Paul's to overwhelm the turmoil in our lives. Pray about everything. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 6. We already read the first part. Rejoice in the Lord always. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything, about everything. See, that's his solution, right? You, you can't help what you think, right? You can't help the thoughts that come into your mind. I used to think that I was supposed to be able to. Over time, you can help that. You can, you can make some changes. But really, you can't, you can't stop thinking about something just by trying really hard not to think about it. And so what, what Paul says is, don't worry about anything, not by trying really hard not to worry about it, not by stopping not thinking about it, but by instead turning it into a prayer, right? That, that's his plan, that the things that are bothering me, that I, that I start talking those things over with God, rather than just telling me, don't do it or you're, <laughs> you're going to suffer the consequences, which is sort of the way that that, well, that's the message I got from the church that I grew up in. Don't do it or you're going to hell, right? That was, I mean, I, I, that's, that's what I thought, whether that's the impression they meant to give me or not. And so I really do kind of understand more and more, the, based on my upbringing in church, the way that Bob Newhart does his uh, therapy. Let's watch this. Well, what other uh, problems would you, would you like to address? <clears throat> Well, I have self-destructive relationships with men. Stop it! <laughs> you you want to be with a man, don't you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, yes. Well, then stop it. <laughs> don't be such a big baby. I wash my hands a lot. That's all right. <laughs> it is? I, I wash my hands all the time. There's a lot of germs out there. Uh-huh. Yeah, don't, don't, uh, don't worry about that one. I'm afraid to drive. Well, stop it! How, how are you going to get around? Get in the car and drive, you, you kook! Stop it! You stop it! You stop it! What's, what's the problem, Kathy? I don't like this. I don't like this therapy at all. You're just telling me to stop it. And, and, you, and you, don't, you don't like that? No, I don't. So you think we're, we're moving too fast, is that it? Yes. Yes, I do. All right, then let me, uh, let me uh, give you ten words that I, I think will 
uh, clear everything up for you. Uh, you want to you want to get a pad and a pencil for this one? All right. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Here are the ten words. Stop it, or I'll bury you alive in a box. And that's sort of the way I felt growing up in church, right? Stop it or you are going straight to hell. Stop it. Right? That, that's not what Jesus says. You know, if you struggle with, with, with fear and anxiety and worry, then give yourself the same kind of compassion that Jesus offers to you, which is all of it. But take the things that you're worried about that wake you up in the middle of the night, start going through this, this process. Okay, always choose joy. Don't worry about anything. Okay, the ship's already sailed there. I'm already, my brain is already spinning, so what am I supposed to do next? Instead, pray about everything and tell God what you need. And so then just start talking to Jesus. Tell him what's bothering you. Tell him what's on your mind, right? Some of you that, that, that are world-class worriers are like this close to being like the greatest prayer warriors that have ever existed because you're just going to talk to God about these things instead of just letting them ramp up in your brain. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 17 says, always be joyful, never stop praying. Now, I used to look at that and be like, is that both of, the, both of those things? Are, are either one of those things possible? And yeah, they are. You just have to put them into practice. Keith Green had a song back during the 70s. It was called No Compromise, but it started out with the line, I'll make my life a prayer to you. And I remember thinking, what would that even look like to make my life into a prayer? Because that's a beautiful thought. And so what I do now is I just kind of carry on a, a, a full-time conversation with God throughout my day. Like he's right there with me because I believe that he is. And so most of the time it's internal. Right? Even while I'm up here, I'll be doing that. Sometimes I'll be like in the middle of a lesson, I'll be like, I don't know what's coming next. I'll be like, oh, Lord, help me. Oh, Lord, help, right? Or, oh, Lord, help these people, right? They came expecting to hear something that's at least kind of borders on comprehensible. And uh, so, Lord, please, please. But sometimes if I think I'm alone, I'll just be talking out loud, and all of a sudden people, I'll hear somebody go, who are you talking to? I'm like, oh, Sorry. Never mind. I'm having a staff meeting. Me and the Lord, right? We're having, we're having ourselves a staff meeting. Fourth, recipe, fourth ingredient in the recipe is be thankful in all things. This is why I almost always do this lesson around Thanksgiving. Because there's deep power in gratitude. Philippians 4, verses 4 through 6. Rejoice in the Lord always. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Thank Him for all He has done. Don't forget that part. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the translations of this says, and don't forget to thank Him for all He's done. Because we do so often. So often, it's like our prayers are just like, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. And we never get around to, oh, and by the way, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for all the blessings in my life. I found this, uh, uh, this picture on the internet too back in November. It said, interrupt anxiety with joy, gratitude, and prayer, and you will find peace. That's basically Philippians 4, 4 through 9 in a nutshell. Interrupt anxiety with joy, gratitude, and prayer, and you will find peace. Now, it may take time. And you may not, depending on the severity of what you're going through, it may just take the edge off at first. But it's just like if, if you're an addict and you're working the 12 steps. You don't start working the 12 steps and all of a sudden it's just like freedom, right? It's like you have to work the steps and you have to keep working the steps. Same thing is true when it comes to peace. You have to work the steps on the pathway to peace. And at first, you, it just may take the edge off. But over time, over time, to the extent that we are able to do this, we can overwhelm worry. Because you can't just get rid of worry. You have to overwhelm it with something else. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, always be joyful, never stop praying. We just read that part. Then he goes on, and be thankful in all circumstances. 
for this is God's will for you. There's another one. Be thankful in all circumstances. Is that even possible? And what Paul would say is, yeah. Right? He wrote this. He wrote Philippians, the treatise on joy, right? The absolute most amazing book on joy that has ever been written. And you'd think, well, he must have been on vacation, right? He must have been feeling good. He must, everything must have been going his way. No, he was in prison. It's one of the last letters that he writes. He's in prison just waiting for Emperor Nero to sign his death warrant, at which point he knows he will be beheaded. And he writes to the church in Philippi and says, always be joyful. And Never, never stop being thankful. Be, don't forget to thank him for everything that he's done. It's like Paul finds reasons to be thankful, not for what he's going through, but in spite of what he's going through. Corey Tinboom, amazing Christian writer. Uh, she grew up, was a teenager during World War II in Holland. Uh, her and her sister were arrested for, for helping Jews, for being basically just just bad citizens of the Nazi regime, right? And they were put into a concentration camps. And they were moved around from camp to camp to camp. At one point, they get put in a camp where when they walk into the women's dormitory, there are fleas everywhere. And Corey hates fleas, she said. And so she pulls back the covers and she says to her sister, oh, it's fleas. And her sister says, Corey, you thank God for the fleas. And she says, I will not thank God for the fleas. And she says, well, I'm going to, her sister said, and said a little prayer thanking God for the fleas. And Corey was just like, said, I thought she was crazy. She said, but it turned out because there were so many fleas in that dormitory, the German guards would not come in. And so they could have worship services. They, they, they could go there and not be bothered by the guards. And she said pretty soon she had to realize that she had something to be thankful for in spite of the fleas or, or even kind of because of the fleas. But at the end of that little paragraph that she was writing, she said, but I still to this day have never given thanks for the fleas. And that's the thing. There are some things that, that are just not, there's, there's nothing to be thankful for them. But you can find something to be thankful for in those circumstances. Philippians 4, 7 says it's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. See, there's the, there's the thought. It has to displace it. You can't just, get, you can't just kick it out. You can't just, just by your own strength decide I'm going to stop thinking about it or stop worrying about it. You have to fill that spot up with something else. Fifth ingredient in this recipe for overwhelming worry is to think about the good stuff. Focus on what's good instead of what's bad, right? It doesn't mean you can't think about the negative because your brain's going to go there, some of you more than others, right? But turn those negative thoughts into prayers, talk to God about them, and then when you're done, leave them at the throne of God and walk away without carrying them with you. Because usually that's what we do, right? Even if we pray about them, we're like, Lord, here's what I'm worried about. I want to bring this to you. I wanted to talk about you. And then we turn around to leave and God says, well, what are you doing with that? Leave it here. And we're like, well, this is my worry. I, I carry it with me. And he's like, no, no, no. That's, that's not how this works. Your shoulders weren't built to carry this kind of weight. You leave that here. And so what we're supposed to do is leave it there at his throne and then turn around and walk away and then just fill our minds with what's good. Philippians 4.8 says you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true and noble and reputable and authentic, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse. Do that. And God, who makes everything work together, will work you into his most excellent harmonies. That is a beautiful thought. And you know what happens when he does that? He, he comes alongside us with whatever it is that we're trying to do, whether it's preach a sermon or teach a class or help somebody that, 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 that we feel like he is leading us to help or whatever it is that you are doing in the name of Jesus, he comes alongside of you and he turns our, 
our ridiculous elementary attempts to do something amazing, and he comes alongside and adds his power to it and makes something miraculous out of what we do. Every time I do this lesson, I show you this little short, it's, it's less than a minute. It was a public service announcement commercial, kind of one of those pass it on things. And it's based on a story about a guy named Ignacy Paderewski, who was actually the prime minister of Poland back during, and I think right after World War II, maybe somewhere in that time frame. He was also one of the world's premier pianists. He could, absolute beautiful piano player. And one day, at one of his concerts, a little boy somehow made it up onto the stage and started banging out chopsticks on his piano. <laughs> and people were horrified, especially the kid's mom and dad, right? And they're freaking out. And Paderewski comes out and tells the kid, keep playing chopsticks, and then reaches around and starts adding his own his own music, and it becomes this beautiful masterpiece. It becomes the, the record that he sold more copies of than any other record in his career. And they made this, uh, this commercial. It's a little bit different, but it's based on the same idea. You'll see. Let's watch. Hey. Where's Tommy? I thought he was with you. No. Jack. Tommy? Go get him. <laughs> Don't stop. Keep playing. from the foundation for a better life. And that's what God does with us. If we do, the, if, if we work these steps, right? If we choose to, to, to always choose joy, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell them what you need. Th give thanks in all things. And then think about the good. If we do that, he says, then God will work you into his most excellent harmonies. And you will find yourself doing things that you never dreamed were possible, which will then bring more joy into your life, which will give you more things to thank him for, which will, it just, it becomes this beautiful cycle rather than a vicious cycle. And it displaces worry. It overwhelms it. Now, does that mean it's gone for good? No, it'll come back. There are times that I back out of the throne room of God trying to have left my worries there and I close the door and I turn around and they're right back there. And so what do you, what, what do, you do at that point? Well, you right back into the throne room of God and say, I don't know how this followed me out, but it was, it's with me again. Here, I'm going to give it back to you. And there are times that I wake up in the middle of the night and I will just, there's this passage from 1 Peter chapter 5. I think it's 5 verse 7 where it says, Cast all of your cares upon him because he cares for you. And the idea of casting is not like a, a, a fishing line that you reel back in. The idea of casting is like if, you, if, if you're trying to throw something into a dumpster that's too heavy for you just to pick up and drop in there, and so you've got to get it kind of going, and then you get it up over the top, and you better let it go. That's a cast in the, in the Greek language. Because if you don't let it go, you're going into the dumpster with it. That's what cast your cares on him means. You throw them at, the, at the, the foot of the throne and you turn around and get out before they can follow you. And when they follow you back in, you turn around and you do it all again. I'll fall asleep sometimes just saying, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Think about the good stuff. Hebrews 12 verses 2 through 3 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What joy is there in the cross? Well, there's none, right? There's no joy in the cross except for what it accomplished. 
And so what this, I think, is saying is Jesus looked past the cross at what it was going to accomplish. What did he see? Well, he saw you. He saw me. He saw the people that, wouldn't, that would have no hope if it wasn't for him. And that brought him great joy. And he focused on that, and it got him through the cross. We're going to talk about that next week. Next week is, is Palm Sunday. The week after that is Easter. So next week, we're going to talk about the cross. We're going to talk about his time in the Garden of Gethsemane and what happened there and see just how much he cares about us. Think about the good stuff. And finally, number six, and this is, this is, this is what we're all hoping for, right? Experience God's peace. Experience the peace. Philippians 4, 7 says, If you do this, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand, and His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. For 18 years, actually 17 years, when I would preach this sermon, I felt a little bad because my life was really pretty easy. And I didn't have a lot that I struggled with, a lot of tragedy that I struggled with. I could see in a lot of your lives that you were going through things that I couldn't even begin to comprehend. And I, and I still, I would preach this because I believe with all my heart that this is what it takes to overwhelm turmoil and to overwhelm pain and suffering. And so I would preach it over and over and over and over and over again. And so when Pastor Jeff died, my, my worship pastor, my next door neighbor, my brother-in-law, my friend, when he died... I had to work through this stuff because suddenly I was kept up in the middle of the night, worried, worried about me, worried about my sister, worried about the church, worried about Pastor Jeff's kids, worried about me, <laughs> right? I, it always comes back to me, and so I would work through these steps. Uh, the next year, we had a big earthquake, right? And I had to work through these steps again. And then in 2019, I had my heart attack. And I can remember, I didn't have a lot of time to worry when I was on my way, uh, you know, when, when, when I started feeling crummy. I didn't have a lot of time to worry when I, it got bad enough that I told Judy, I was like, you better take me to the doctor. I didn't have a lot of time to worry when that trip to the doctor became a trip to the fire station and a call to 911, and they were waiting for me when I got there. I didn't have time to worry about it. Didn't have time to worry about it when they ushered me into the ambulance and laid me down and strapped me up to all this stuff. Didn't even have time to worry when they said, uh, we're taking you to the hospital right now because you are having some kind of heart event. And so off we went. Now, I had time to worry about Judy driving. Who She's, she's not a great driver in the best of circumstances. I'm like, can she come with us? And the, the guy was like, wouldn't you rather ha her have the car there at the hospital? I'm like, no. No, I wouldn't. And he was like, well, let me go out and talk to her. All of a sudden, the next thing I know, he's back in and we're driving away. He's like, no, she said she's going to drive. And I'm like, oh, great, you know. So I say a prayer for Judy driving, you know, behind us and stuff. And then, then I had time for it to kind of come back to me. And I started to freak out. And I thought, you know what? That's not going to be, if this is a heart event, that's not going to be good for you. So stop it. And that didn't work. So, uh, so I laid back and I thought, well, what? What, 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 do I, what have I been telling those people at Riverside to do all these years? And I thought, Philippians 4. And so I closed my eyes, and as we made our way to the hospital, I just started going through it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And I started talking to him about the things that were bothering me. Don't forget to thank him for everything that he's done. And so I started doing that. Focus on the good. And if you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far greater than the human mind can understand. And His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And I just kind of went through that as I rode in the ambulance. And I got to tell you, a kind of peace came over me that I can't explain to you. And I had no idea how bad this was. Turns out it wasn't that bad. It could have been worse if Judy hadn't been real quick at getting me to the to the fire station, but it what turned out it wasn't, I was never that close to death's door. I didn't know that. And so I thought, well, what happens if this is the end? What happens? And I, I had a piece that I, I, I always wondered, how would I face that? And pretty peaceful as it turns out. I won't, wanted to stick around. I don't, I don't want to leave Judy. I don't want to leave Jonathan. I don't want to leave all of you folks. 
But if I had, I was strangely peaceful and okay with it. And that, I'm very pleased to know that now, <laughs> now that I'm back on this side of it again. But this is, this stuff works, folks. And it's important that we, that we work these steps. I want to finish with this. 1 John 3, verse 20. John says, this is the way we know that we belong to the way of truth. When our hearts make us feel guilty, we can still have peace before God. For God is greater than our troubled hearts. And he knows everything. When you struggle with worry and you start beating yourself up because you're struggling with worry and your troubled heart accuses you, what you do is you say, yeah, but Jesus doesn't. Jesus doesn't accuse me. Jesus forgives me. Jesus came to bring me his peace. And so even if I'm struggling with it, he's greater than our troubled hearts. So here is your follow-through step for week 13. Work the steps now. I, I said before you need them. That's what I said back in November. Work the steps now that you do need them because I have a feeling all of us can use it. And your memory verse is Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. Commit that to memory, folks, because you're going to need it sometime when you don't have the ability to look at it on a page or get out your phone. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your son. We are so grateful for the life that he came to give to each and every one of us and the fact that he wants to, to flood our hearts and our minds with his peace even when our hearts are in the midst of their most troubled states. And so, Lord... Teach us to always choose joy, to not worry about anything, instead to pray about everything, to tell you everything that we need, to never forget to thank you for what you've already done, and then to focus our minds on the good, to cast our anxiety upon you because you care for us. Lord, help us to, to have the wisdom to commit these things to our memory so that when we wake up in the middle of the night and we need them the most, they are there to meditate on and to bring us peace and to overwhelm the turmoil that we are experiencing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you online next week, I would imagine. Don't worry about a thing Cause heaven you think it's gonna be all right